Yeah. We are Locked On Houston Astros, and we hope that you join us for a daily Locked On Astros podcast. My name is Eric Heisman. You can find me on Twitter at Eric Talk Astros. You find the show at Locked On Astros, your team every day. Brett, where can they find you on Twitter? They can find me at H-Town Wheelhouse on Twitter and at Strohs411 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Always positive, always Strohs. And we have uh, Grayson Skiers. Is that how you say it? Squares, like the squares. shape. Okay, Squares. Yeah. Where can they find you on Twitter and your writing? Yes, you can find me on Twitter at Grayson Squares. Uh, Grayson is spelled with the A, and then my last name is spelled S-K-W-E-R-E-S. Uh, I'm always publishing my work on Twitter, and I write for SportsMap.com, which is affiliated with the ESPN 97.5 here in town. Awesome, awesome. So we got a lot to talk about. I almost did a show Saturday because there's so much news that came out on Friday, and it was it was just amazing. But we'll talk about that. We'll talk about who the Astros offered a qualifying offer to. We'll talk about um, who the Astros said bye bye to. And there's just so much for us to talk to. But don't forget to talk that if you want to get locked on Astros, you could do so on the podcast NAP Himalaya as well as Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. And when you get in car, tell your smart device played podcast, Locked on Astros. Okay, so Grayson, uh, one of the big topics over the past week has been, do you offer Michael Brantley a qualifying offer? And I, I, I was saying no, because what if he accepted that? That's $18.9 million. Yes, you could have maybe got him on it, um, maybe do extension or something, but that's very scary for the Astros to do. And I know a lot of people are saying, well, uh, they, they, they made a wrong decision. What do you think about that decision? Yeah. So when the off season first got here, I initially thought that they should give him the qualifying offer, but as time went on and as I did more research, I, I quickly you know came to the opposite conclusion and uh, you know, Michael Brantley, as much as I love the guy, you know, I'm a student athlete. I emulate my swing after him Either He's starting to show signs of regression. He swung and missed up the fastball twice as much in 2020 as he did in 2019 and that's a sign of age when you can't catch up with the fastball and your hands are slowing down it's hard to be an effective hitter and I think even in a normal year he's still good enough to where you can justify paying that 19 million you know roughly 19 million but in this market where you know Brad Hand's getting waived um, I think it's it's more uh, poignant for the team to prioritize flexibility and keeping that money open rather than taking that risk of him accepting it. Yeah, I think they've got multiple factors here keeping him out. A, you know, your age, like you talked about. Also, the huge financial hit that Major League Baseball took between, you know, three point seven to eight billion dollar hit. You know, the receipts that they didn't have coming in um, seem to. I mean, it's going to bog down the entire system. The guys aren't going to get paid this year what they normally get paid. And so, at the end of the day, like you said, regression. He's thirty six. And also another point is he was hurt a little bit last year and you're not going to play him out in the field. You're going to want to DH him. And you've got Jordan Alvarez coming back with two healthy knees. Hopefully he's full strength. Hopefully. And he's going to, and he's going to be DHing most of the season. I mean, they'll probably get him out in the field some, but that's his spot. And, and you, you, you're not going to platoon Brantley and Alvarez. You're going to put Alvarez in spot starts in the outfield. And who knows, maybe, maybe they offered Brantley a, you know, I was saying, I, I know his market value right now is right at 12 million. So, you know, if someone offers him two for 24, he'll probably take it, but they really only have about $20 million cap room. If you're figuring that they go after, you know, to stay at 190, 195, if they look at staying under the 200 million, then they only got about 19 to $20 million to play with. And, if you do that, then you you can't sign anybody else. I know y'all did a lot of the number stuff yesterday, um, and so I'm going to go real quick right here. Um, so, but the the luxury tax threshold for 2020 is or 2021 is 210 million. This past year is at 208. You know, not accounting for the shortened season. Um, the Astros were at 230 million in estimated luxury tax last year. This this upcoming season, they're currently allotted for 171, as far as what I have seen. And so I think 200 million for the luxury tax is a, is a fair goal to be under if you're Jim Crane, you know, I'm not Jim Crane. I'm not just dis- deciding how much he spends. He is, but I think 200 million, a $30 million pay, uh, you know, payroll slash or luxury tax slash is, is big. And last point real quick. I think the payroll for the Astros this year is more important than the luxury tax. Astros fans got obsessed with the luxury tax this past year because we had to worry about it for the first time ever. 
but I don't think the Astros are even thinking about coming anywhere close to that 210 million this year. And so payroll takes on an added importance because it's how much are they actually spending. And in 2021, they have 153 million in estimated payroll after you take on the guaranteed contracts, 40 man roster guys and estimated uh, arbitration raises. So I would say a realistic target for payroll is $185 million, which gives you a little bit more than that 19, 20 million you said. Well, if you, if you just look at the market, uh, these players were offered the qualifying offer. This, I mean, I don't keep track of it normally, but it was only six players. Trevor Bauer with the Reds, DJ LeMahieu with the Yankees, JT Riomuto with the Phillies, George Springer with the Astros, and Marcus Stroman with the Mets. And somebody that I did not expect to see on this list is Kevin Gossman. I mean, I'm like, what is up with that? That's kind of random, but... At the same time, that just shows what the market is. We see people like Brad Hand um, not being have being waived or whatever it was, and it's just it's just crazy. I don't think you're gonna see a lot of spending. And the winter meetings and the GM meetings, they're gone. Uh, they're gonna be all probably through Zoom this year because of uh, COVID nineteen and everything. So yeah, the market after especially playing all these games without a fans there the teams are going to be hurting for a little bit and to, for them to go out and guarantee 18.9 million to Michael Brantley, that's something they, they could probably get a backup out. They can get another outfielder and a reliever for that amount of money. Now I have a question um, with all these, you know, dollars not being spent, um, you know, guys like Brad hand out there, um, guys like workmen, um, Jeffress out there, guys that are uh, that are your lower end um, payment guys. Um, you've got your higher end relievers like Mark Mark Malincicun. Um, I believe he's thirty six, but he's around fourteen fifteen million. Cologne, I think this last year made like or he was valued at nineteen. So those guys are the higher end relief pitchers. Do you think guys like that, Grayson, even Cologne, you know Malincicun? these 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 quality guys will command a little bit around that or do you think their market will come in way under what it was in 2020 because of the budget crunch everybody's in i think those two guys are a little bit different melanson's definitely towards the end of his career um and he got that big contract with the san francisco giants before they traded him to the atlanta braves a few years ago but he's probably on his last contract or he's, you know, of his career, if it's a multi-year deal. And if it's not a multi-year deal, it's, you know, he's going to take a couple of one-year deals in succession. And so I think Melanson's probably going to land in that, you know, five to $8 million range. Uh, I would put Colome a little bit similar. I think he has a more earning potential because he's a little bit younger. And I think that he is a legitimate uh, closer option for some teams where I think Melanson's probably a seventh or eighth inning guy at this point. And so column A might be in that eight to $12 million range, depending on the market. But if Brad hands, not getting 10, I had, it's a hard time envisioning column A getting 12. Yeah. And uh, I, I think it all depends on the individual player. Like George Springer is probably going to get what he deserves maybe, but some of the other guys may not. Be. So it just all depends on the quality of the player. And uh, the Astros uh, sent these guys out on uh, outright waivers and they've elected free agency so they're basically no longer astro chase de young chris davinsky dustin grano and roberto osona so they're all gone um that's not a big surprise there i think dustin grano is a little bit of a surprise i thought they would keep him on i know he didn't really do much but i think he really liked being on the astros team so we'll have to see what happens but they don't have a backup catcher and is this finally the time that Garrett Stubbs is going to get a shot? Or are they hoping that uh, somebody in a minor league system comes up? There's not really anyone in the minor league system of note, especially close. They did draft Corey Lee, uh, not in the, this last draft, but with the last first round pick that they had prior to, to the sign stealing scandal. Uh, but he never even got a full minor league season because this last one was taken. So um, if they do bring in an outsider, it's going to be via the trade market or free agent market. I think they do give Garrett Stubbs a, sh a chance. I think they go to spring training planning on Garrett Stubbs being the backup catcher. And uh, something that I was kind of looking at earlier today, you know, guys like Sinel Perez, Austin Pruitt, uh, who have no minor league options remaining and are going to be uh, in that roster crunch towards the end of spring training, you might see those guys floated for a backup catcher. You know, the Indians have two catchers that they're paying $5 million dollars. 
uh, would they take an arm like Sinal Perez and give up one of Hedges or Roberto Perez, you know? And there's a couple of other teams in that same spot. So I think if they go outside, that's the way they go. So James Click is going to probably do a lot of moves this offseason, and you want to make sure he's he's not hungry and he's kind of thinking straight. So, um, Brett, what could he eat while he's on phone calls, doing some phone calls? Um, I'm glad you asked because there is a there's an amazing product on the market. It's it's, a, it's called Built Bar, and um, as a seasoned veteran to protein bars, I can tell you this one basically it separates itself. It is it is unlike any other protein bar out there. It's wrapped in 100% chocolate. It's great for the healthy, conscious guy or girl. It is great if you're trying to lose or maintain your weight, um, and it is loaded with protein. It doesn't have a ton of carbs has very low sugar content and at the end of the day it's what you need it's what gets me through my day i can't go my mid-morning or my mid-afternoon without my built bar and their flavors are unreal they actually have a limited um flavor it's a it's a pumpkin spice type of holiday flavor and it is phenomenal we just got a new box in so i want you to go to builtbar.com and put the code locked on, you'll get 20% off your first order when you go to builtbar.com. This is the best bar on the market. You won't, once you try this bar, you won't try any other bar. Builtbar.com, get your 20% off today with the locked on code. It's an amazing bar. Speaking of an amazing bar, let's talk about an amazing coach who's now coaching for the Detroit Tigers. This is something that we kind of talked about last week was AJ Hinch was likely to be the, the Tigers manager. And what really scares me about this, we can talk a little bit more about this, but Justin Verlander, he actually talked to Justin Verlander and he said, look, when Detroit is winning, it's a great city to be in. And so uh, I think Verlander kind of encouraged him. And it kind of brings up something we talked about the other day is that uh, Verlander is going to miss the entire 2021 season. Then he's a free agent is does that mean he's going to go back home to Detroit to play with AJ Hinch? Grayson. Um, I think it's just so tough to speculate that far in advance. And I know Astros fans have a reverence for AJ Hinch. Um, I'm a little less bullish on him and just to present a different aspect to it. Cause I think I probably have a different opinion than most Astros fans. If your, if your boss made it known that he didn't like what you were doing and then you kept doing it anyways and you faced no repercussions, what does that say about your respect level for that person, right? Mm-hmm. And A.J. Hinch came out and he said that, his, that he learned from that and that he's changed and that he's grown, but it's all public knowledge now. And I think A.J. Hinch is going to face some struggles gaining the respect of the locker room. You know, the, he's got to recover from that. He's got to be different and learn from his mistakes. And it's not a foregone conclusion that he's going to be successful there. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, I think what he has going for him is the young talent that they're bringing up. Of course, I know the young talent is probably at least a season or two away. I mean, they don't have Astros. They don't they don't have a ton of like major league ready guys, but they have guys that are on the cusp and guys that can probably probably be kind of accelerated through the minor league system with as high pick were and with as far along in their college careers they were that makes a difference they weren't you know high school seniors coming out and they're having to wait three or four years of the minors but with that said um just reaction from tigers nation from what i've seen just kind of, of course i say tigers nation i'm kind of lumping about probably 10 or 20 people i know that are you know hardcore detroit tigers fans and they're they're really excited. They're optimistic. Um, a lot of people are saying, "Is it too soon? Did he did he did he get punished properly because of the shortened season?" And I think yes, he did. He got fired. He got suspended. He didn't. He wasn't allowed to work in baseball for a full year. And you actually make a really good point there. And and I know I know a lot of people will die on the hill for you know for AJ Hampton. The second you say that, someone's listening this you know podcast going oh that's bull crap like AJ Hinch is the man and you know you have your guys that you're dying that are your dying the wool AJ Hinch guys and so I think he's gonna struggle um I think it's not gonna be because of him um but I think any edge they they gain or or any positive thing they gain I think AJ Hinch still has that to give um I do think that he has he has changed and he has learned 
but the microscope will be on him. Um, every little thing will be watched. And um, the second there is just an inkling of dissent in the locker room that will be exploited, especially by that, de by that Detroit free press. Um, we know they, they love to report things. Yeah. My, the school that I attend um, is in the same town in Florida as D as the tiger spring training. And so because of that, I pay a little bit extra attention to the tigers than pr definitely your ever average Astros fan does. And so they do have an exciting young core of players. Willie Castro and Isak Paredes are two guys that, that debuted in their lineup this year that are foundational type pieces on the mound. Uh, Casey Mize and Tarek Skubal debuted. Matt Manning's around the corner. And then there's the guys that they got in, from the Astros in the Verlander trade, Daz Cameron and Franklin Perez, not too far away either. So he does have a lot of exciting young talent. But again, you know, uh, that was blatant disrespect from, from the players uh, with the Astros, you know, they knew he didn't like it. They did it anyways. And that doesn't say a lot about his ability to command a locker room. So he can very well prove me wrong, but he's going to face an uphill battle there. Well, he can uh, fight off El Jefe over there in uh, Carlos Beltran. So uh, yeah, I, I know what you're saying. And a lot of people are looking past that and saying, well, look what he did on the field. Yes. But uh, that did show a flaw. So we'll have to see, but there will be a much younger core there. So I saw something and I, it can't be true. There's only one manager spot left. Could Alex Cora go back to Boston? Would that, what would that look like? I mean, I know they parted ways. He wasn't fired, but would that be sending the wrong message? I'll tell you this right off the bat. It would not surprise me at all. Um, that entire team has been absolved of blame in the court of public opinion, um, i.e. Joe Kelly, Mookie Betts, David Price going to the Dodgers. Um, everything hangs on the guy that was in the clubhouse and nobody blames anybody else in the Red Sox organization. Now, um, our, our guy on um, Sully who does Locked on MLB, you guys want to check out Locked on MLB. Um, he does a phenomenal job. He is a, he grew up a Red Sox fan and he, basically abandoned his team after 2018 because of what they did. But I would not be shocked if Cora went back. Um, I, I just, I honestly don't see major league baseball do anything about it. Um, I don't, I don't think, I think the fans forgive and forget. Um, it's not Houston. And, and bottom line is they get treated differently because they're Boston. I don't know. Grayson, what do you think of that take? Am I on or am I off? I think you're, I think you're headed in the right direction. You know, the one thing to look at with Cora um, you know, he's way more qualified than any of the other candidates that got put out there, uh, that were, that they reported today. Tony La Russa. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> Still, go ahead. Right. Um, you know, the one thing that I'd look out for, if it's not Boston, uh, the New York Mets, I mean, they have a new owner and if Steve Cohen wants to come in and clean house and, and take a look at Alex Cora, maybe, you know, I have the same opinions with Alex Cora that I have with AJ Hinch. Um, the, the thing that's different there is the players respected Cora and they followed his lead here in Houston. Um, say what you will about MLB's investigation in 2018, whether it's legitimate or not. Um, personally, if I'm in a hiring position, I don't know if I'd give him a job, but I totally agree that it's a possibility. All right. So I know, I believe you wrote an article about George Springer and we're kind of talking about it off air. Do you see George Springer returning back to Houston? No, I, I, I believe the report. The report makes sense. Um, he, he's from Connecticut and he's very close with his parents. And, uh, you know, he's getting to that age where he and his wife are probably wanting to have kids and the, you know, the grandparents want the grandkids close to him. And I think he's going to take a hard, long look at the Northeast and returning back closer to home and, and being closer to his family. And I think he loved his time in Houston, but in his eyes, it's just time to close, close that chapter and move on. See, this is this is what I'm wondering. Do you think he goes to Boston, A, because of that, um, but solely because right now the market may not lend itself for him to go somewhere else to make that big contract to cash in? Because if it were me um, and, and I'm putting on my George Springer hat, I want to go to a perennial playoff team. Like I want to go somewhere where they have a chance to compete. And right now Boston's not any place to compete next year at least I don't I don't see it um 
do those things not play a factor this year because of where we are, where people aren't getting paid as much as they normally would? Like if George Springer's free agent year was last year, are we before COVID hit, are we talking like it's a slam dunk? He goes somewhere like Boston. You know what I'm saying? Is that, is that why he's going there and why he maybe won't sign other places because people aren't going to be able to sell out the money? Well, I'm not sure it's a complete slam dunk for Boston. You know, keep in mind that this is a guy that's going to get a hundred million dollars or more. So close for him is relative, right? You know, he doesn't need to be living in Connecticut. He can just be a short flight away. Um, And so, because traveling for him is a lot more financially feasible. And so, you know, Boston, I think will be in the mix for him, but if I had to guess, I would say that they're third place simply because they are in that downturn right now. Like they, they weren't willing to pay Mookie Betts a year before in a, in a good market and a good economy. Why are they going to be willing to pay George Springer now? in a bad economy, right? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so again, the Mets right there because of the new ownership. And then the other one that no one's talking about, the Toronto Blue Jays, that's a team that's not hurting as much financially. One, because COVID hasn't been as, as bad in Canada as it's been here in the United States. And two, they're owned by the largest telecoms company in Canada, and they're not hurting during this pandemic. So the, the cash flow for the Toronto Blue Jays is not an issue. That's that's not far from Connecticut whatsoever. And I can really see them making a play for George Springer. I agree with you. I think that if he goes anywhere, it will be to the Mets. I think that just makes so much sense. I, I think that team is one good hitter with their pitching staff, one good hitter away from really being a good playoff team. And if you put George Springer at the top of that lineup, that, then he's going to click. So uh, speaking of click, the Astros did pick up Brooks Raley's $2 million option for 2021 season. I know Brett, you're, you're really excited about that. And you, that's your, that's your guy. So um, what do you think about this guy? Is this somebody that is just for next year or do you think that they may try to extend him? And that's about enough time. Break. <laughs> sorry. Oh. <laughs> that was a joke no, there. I'm sorry. But, uh, oh. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> No, I think I think Brooks Raley, if if he continues to do, I think it, if he turns out um, a year kind of like he did this year, of course, we haven't seen him in a full season. Um, the more experience he has with the staff, the more experience he has um, with Machete behind the plate, the more experience he has with Brent Strom. I think it sets up nicely. You know, I don't I don't think the relief pitching. Um, I, I know they need relief pitchers, but I don't I don't see the pitching. Um, needs as dire as most people do. Most people are freaking out. Oh, Springer and Brantley are gone. We're going to be a trash team. And it's like, no, we've got solid pitchers. You know, Rayleigh around him has got guys like Scrub, has got these guys around him um, to build. I see Rayleigh having a successful year. And if he does well, why not? Why not offer him another, you know, two-year deal um, where you can get him at a budget price and he's in your system. He knows how everything works. I mean, he's got to prove it in 2021 again. You know, I'm not ready to sign any checks for him right now. Right. But when I dove into the numbers, I was so blown away. Um, you know, you watch him on TV and he looks like he has very average stuff at best. You know, and it looks like the type of guy where it's a race to the bat rack to, to get in that bat off of him. But you dive into his numbers and he was he's the typical Astros guide where he's high spin. He's got he's 93rd percentile in fastball spin. He's 94th percentile in slider spin. And the second he got to the Astros, Brent Strom did what he always does. He said, stop throwing your fastball, throw your off, throw your breaking ball. Your breaking ball is good, spin it. And his cutter usage dropped in half, and he started throwing that slider, and he locates. And so if he continues to do that next season, like he can absolutely hang around for longer than just 2021. All right, so looking at the two Astros who struggled this year, Alex Bregman and Jose Altuve, um, I'm assuming that both of them are going to really bounce back next year with, with the full season. We've seen how long it takes for Alex Bregman to get going. Which guy do you think will refer return to form the most? I think it's got to be Alex Bregman. I mean, you know, I, I love Jose Altuve. Um, he, he can still be a very good player. But one thing that I look at it as this, this, 2015 through 2020 period of the Astros was the Jose Altuve and George Springer era, right? And with George Springer on his way out of town and Jose Altuve being on the wrong side of 30, it's time for the next era of Astros baseball. And if the next era of Astros baseball is going to be successful, it's going to be on the back of Alex Bregman. He's the MVP candidate and he's got to get back to his 2019 performance. And I think he will. Uh, He had some mechanical issues that he talked about. He was, he wants to pull the ball to the pull side in the air 
and he wants to hit the ball low, you know, line drives to the opposite field. And he was doing the opposite of that. And so if he can get back to, to back spinning the ball to the pull side and driving it in the air, he'll get back to the Alex Bregman of old. Yeah, I think, I think with the off season, I think both of them are going to see a vast improvement. I don't think 2021 is going to present really any different challenge in it just being another year. Of course, Altuve is older. And so he's a little bit longer in the tooth when it comes to his baseball life. But I just see at the end of the day, um, I think Altuve comes out of this offseason probably looking more prepared than he has in the last two years just because of injuries, because of various things that he's hit along the way. And we were able to see him kind of come out of that a little bit in the, in the playoffs, kind of turn things around offensively. Defensively, um, I, I can't help but to think that he's going he's gonna to do a lot of work. But Right now, we know Bregman doesn't really need the work. I mean, he gets it done. You know, he made a couple errors trying to trying to bare hand and grab a ball. But, I mean, who doesn't miss a ball, you know, screaming at them, catching it bare hand? I mean, that's that's such a difficult play to make. Um, I see I see kind of the same thing with what you're looking at, where Alex Bregman has another solid year. And if he does, he could put himself in the hunt for MVP. But, you know – I really see Jose Altuve getting back to 300, to be honest with you. If not, he'll be in the, he'll be in the mid to high two nineties um, going back there. I just, I have a real, I have a real strong feeling that he's going to get back to there because he's going to go back and dive into what he did and didn't do. And a lot of times he was swinging. He was, he wasn't swinging at stuff he normally swings at. And I mean, he was swinging at stuff that he didn't normally swing at. And he just, he, he looked uncomfortable half the time on the field. He didn't look like himself. And I really think this whole scandal took a toll on him mentally. Um, and I'm serious when I say this, like whoever Framber Valdez talked to in the off season, I think maybe that, that like psychologist needs to be hired by the entire team and needs to sit down with all those guys because 2021, even if you got 20, 30% stadiums filled, they're going to get stuff thrown at them. They're going to get the jeers. They're going to get, I mean, that criticism still there. I mean, if Halloween's any, any telltale sign of 2021. I mean, people are going to live to simply make their life miserable. Yeah. So um, this is something that kind of surprised me and it kind of shows the market. Charlie Morton was um, basically was uh, they declined his option. And so now he's a free agent that kind of shows the market. Everybody knows how good a pitcher he is in those crucial game sevens and everything. And, the the race they said you know what uh i think we can find a cheaper option so that just kind of shows what's going on with this network i mean i know that Corey kluber is not really Corey, Corey kluber but you have john lester out there and then mike zunino i we remember him in that series but there's a lot of big names here and so it just it's just kind of weird to see how this off season kind of unfolds and uh, one of the things the Astros have done is they've they went ahead and had a uh, a some furloughs and some layoffs. One of those was Kevin Goldstein. He was the guy who uh, Jeff Luno brought on. And I know uh, if you listen to the Edge podcast by Ben Ryder, he talks a lot about him. But th- that was kind of surprising. But I think that's also the the front office trying to go a little bit different direction. Uh, do you wonder with click it involved now, do you think that they're still going to go away from the scouting or, and kind of focus more on the numbers, or do you think that they, you see them build up the scouting department a little bit more Grayson? I think we'll see them build up eventually. Who knows what's going to happen here in 2021 and it may take some time, but assuming that things eventually get back to normal, the Rays have a very big front office with a, with a large scouting, uh, scouting department. And uh, the Astros are about as thin as it gets. And so I expect click will emulate um, what he had in Tampa Bay and that they'll build, you know, a sizable front office in Houston as well when the time is right. Yeah, I see, I see them doing, you know, some of the same things, just getting, getting things built up. It, it right now has everything to do with the financials. Um, I don't, I don't know if it, if it depends on whether they want to build, build things up or right now, I, I think they probably have, have what they need. Um, and I mean, who knows? I don't know if you guys have heard, have we heard anything about the projection of the minor leagues? Remember the last we heard before COVID hit 
was, you know, they were going to be slashing minor league teams and clubs were going to be basically shut down. So that whole picture, that hasn't even really been talked about as far as I know. I mean, maybe I'm just not in the right circles, but I mean, if they start reducing clubs and then, you know, I mean, are we going to really have a minor league season? Is it going to be abbreviated or does it go along with baseball and just follow that trend? Well, I know that they've kind of talked about the spring training. They're going to have a staggered uh, amount. So they'll have like triple A report first. They'll have spring training. They'll begin their season and then double A will come in. Uh, they'll train and then they'll start their season, something like that. So they're doing this. St- I remember seeing something like that. Grayson, you could tell me if you saw something like yeah, that. Yeah, I, I saw that as well. I think that's 100% correct that they, they are going to stagger the minor leagues. And then I also, from what I've heard, they are 100% cutting those minor league teams. Um, so I think it's 42 teams across all of Major League Baseball are, are going right. to go. And I think the draft is, is going to be shortened from 40 to 25 rounds as well. I don't know if that's been officially announced, but for, as far as I know, that is 100% their plan. Yeah, they're just trying sure. to save some money out there. And just uh, I know the Players Association is probably fighting this, but it's uh, they're, they're trying to find ways to save money. And this is all Jeff Luno's plan. And so uh, <laughs> we'll see what happens there. But go ahead, Brett. No, I, I was just kind of kind of jokingly say, so I guess that means all the all the parents that have their kids in select ball need to start spending an extra two or three grand because there's going to be fewer spots available in the major leagues or in the minor leagues for those uh, ring chasing parents to get their kids up there. Right. I was already a 40th round guy at best. So I've got to improve my stock 15 rounds this year. <laughs> Well, good luck with that. Um, so, um, Grayson, uh, go and tell us about your most recent article you wrote, where they can find it, and where they can find you on Twitter. Yeah, so the most recent uh, piece that I wrote was about the bullpen, and I, I dove into some of those advanced numbers with all of the guys that played major roles in 2020 from um, Ryan Presley and Oli Paredes, Blake Taylor, Andre Scrub, Rayleigh, um, and I believe that's it that's in that story. And so it gives you a little bit of an idea of just how well that those guys performed and how they project for the future and how big of a hole is the bullpen really. And you can find that on sportsmap.com or you can find it on my Twitter account. I'm always retweeting my stories at Grayson Squares. That is spelled G-R-A-Y-S-O-N-S-K-W-E-R-E-S. And I know that um, Brett laughed at me, but I said that next year Christian Javier will have more wins than Frommer Valdez. Uh, Do you think that's possible? Who knows on wins? Cause that's just such a crap shoot. I, I mean, roll the dice. Um, but you know, based on the advanced numbers, Javier uh, performed better and, and made hitters look more foolish than Framber Valdez. Since Framber's a little bit older and has a little bit more experience, I think he has a better year in 2021, but as far as who's more important in the long run for the Astros, it's really neck and neck. Yeah. And uh, I forgot who it was on. Uh, maybe it was Ben or somebody, but they said, well, it could be like 18 and 17. So it could be a tie like that. Exactly, yeah. like. <laughs> what if what if they both win 20? Push. Yes. So, all right, uh, Brad, you got any closing words? No, just um, continue to make sure y'all tune in to Locked on Astros. We've got some really interesting shows coming up. And, uh, you know, we've got some, we've got a special edition show this week. So, Y'all sit tight for that. Um, Eric and I haven't talked all the deets, but it'll be fun. I cannot wait. All right. So, guys, that's all we got for tonight's Locked On Astros podcast. Make sure you go check out our friends Soli over Locked On MLB podcast and go check out Gabrielle over at the Locked On Red Sox podcast. Who does she think is going to be the next Red Sox manager? And um, we'll talk to you tomorrow. <laughs>